grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin in verse 12. <clears throat> Paul writes, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all of these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Join me as we pray. Father, I pray that you are honored today. I pray that Jesus will be lifted high, that you will draw people to yourself. I pray that the same Holy Spirit that inspired the words of this Bible would be present to unstop deaf ears and open blind eyes and make hearts beat for Jesus. We individually and collectively, we confess, Lord, I confess, I need you. And so help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Here we are once again on a rainy Sunday. I feel as if now all I know is rainy Sundays. I guess I should be thankful it's not freezing rain Sunday. But it seems like every time it starts to rain and the temperature starts to drop, somebody out there conjures up seeing an icicle and everybody wants to counsel. But here we are on a Sunday. What compels us then to come and keep coming and working to make sure we are able to meet on a Sunday? And, and why don't we just say, well, since, since it's raining outside, why don't we individually stay home? All of you here, I'm... Assuming most of you have a screen of some kind, probably connected to the internet, most likely on Facebook, why don't you just stay home and watch the service online? What compels us to want to come here into this room together and sing together and, and to de declare together and in front of the congregation? I mean, I mean why don't we just do the baptism at a more private ceremony. Certainly it would be m much less embarrassing with everybody watching. Why do we do that? Why do we gather together and do these things together and sing together? Read the Bible together. Why do we as a church put all of our emphasis on what goes on on the Lord's Day on Sunday? With a little book of Colossians, remember now when you're reading the Bible, what is the context, how is it written, and why? A man named Paul, who was the apostle, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote this little book called Colossians. It is a letter, and it is to a congregation just like all of you. Too often, when we're reading the Bible, we think, well, this applies to me personally, and certainly it does. But what we fail to see so many times is that what is written in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, is written to the church. And so when you see the word you in Colossians, it's almost always plural, talking about the church. We've picked up in the middle of Paul writing, and in chapter 3 he's speaking to the church, and he's saying, if indeed you've been raised, if you actually are a Christian, so this is written to Christians, if you have been raised up with Christ, there are some things you've got to take off. You can read it for yourself. You've got to take some things off. And in verse 12, now he's saying to believers, here's what worship should do. 
Here's what you got to put on. Colossians is to believers and it's about worship. If you're not a Christian today, you're here. You, you are, we're so glad you're watching, but that's what you're doing. You're watching. You're not actually worshiping. Why? I think this passage speaks to worship. That worship, in fact, I'll say it like this. Worship is a life lived in the shadow of the cross. Everything about our worship has to be lived in the shadow of the cross of Jesus. Jesus, who lived perfectly, died on the cross in the place of sinners. God raised him from the dead. He's ascended into heaven. And to be a Christian, you must turn from sin and believe that, the gospel. And without the gospel, you can't actually worship. What does worship teach us? Well, let's talk about worship for a little bit. We'll start in verse 12. Here's the first thing. <clears throat> Number one, worship reminds us, worship reminds us who we are, who we are, especially in Christ. Let me call your attention to it in verse 12. Notice how he starts off with the phrase, put on. Well, we're going to get to what he says to put on. But before we get to that, he breaks it and addresses us. So this is who we are. There are three words there, three phrases. Follow them with me in verse 12. Put on then, here come the phrases. Here's the first one, as God's chosen people. That's one descriptor. The next one is holy. Do you see it? That's the second descriptor. And then the third one is beloved. So you take those three phrases out and they become descriptions of who we are. God's chosen people, you are holy, and you are loved. Let's go through them one by one. God's chosen ones. What in the world does that mean? It's the same thing that Paul will write to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. We are chosen before the foundation of the world. It's the same thing that Paul will write to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 1, 4. That he's assuming that you are chosen. It's what, it's what Peter says in 1 Peter 2, that you are God's chosen. In fact, if you're in Christ, it ought to warm your heart when you look back in the Old Testament. Do you remember what God called Israel? Israel is God's chosen people. So that the church coming up out of Israel is an expression of what it means for God to give us Grace. That word chosen is nothing more than telling us the word grace. That God has made it so that it is not you who look smart becoming a Christian, but it's him who looks loving in choosing us. There is beauty in grace. You know what grace does? Grace crushes, grace crushes my pride. It ought to crush yours. Let me tell you why. Because grace reminds us that there's not one person sitting in here that's better than anybody else. That all of us are born into sin, we choose to sin, and because of that, we are sinners before God, and God in His grace comes to us. That keeps us from thinking we are better than anybody else. You know what grace does? Grace not only crushes pride, grace exalts God. Grace reminds us that this is God's doing, this is God working. This is not you as such a great religious person. This is God coming to us while we were, we're still sinners. Isn't that what the Bible says? Grace reminds us that, that this is God's doing. Grace, you know what grace does? Grace makes us grateful when you understand that it is God coming in His grace to you. You know what grace does? Grace gives me confidence. Not in myself. Grace gives me confidence that I don't have to work to somehow get God to love me, that He loved me already. You know what grace does? When you understand grace... And you understand that it was God working to save you, that He did that. That means that all of us are sinners and need God's forgiveness. Grace makes it so that I am much quicker to forgive people. When you understand grace, you understand what it took for God to save you and to forgive you of your sin. And when someone sins against you and they will, when somebody hurts you, you're quick to forgive them even when you hate their sin. Even... Even when their crime is so bad against you, their crime against you does not rise to the level of your crime against God. Grace reminds me to forgive people. Grace, grace promotes holiness, makes me want to pursue God. It's who we are. And when we understand who we are, it makes us want to worship. 
Why do we gather together? It's because God has saved you and saved you not as an individual. He saved you to be a part of a body. And coming together, we are reminded that we are chosen. But not only chosen, notice the other word there. There are two more. The second word is the word holy. Do you see it? The word holy. That word holy is uh, the word sanctified. It is to be made like God. We are chosen by God. That is, that is grace. And that word holy is uh, sanctification. And we're reminded that it is God who makes us holy. In fact, this is a good thing to remember about your own identity. One of the things about getting good theology, when you start understand the holiness, holiness of God, you're, you know your own sinfulness, and you get stuck there. You be careful, don't get stuck in this sort of framework of thinking that you are somehow some hated sinner. Because we preach here from the Bible that God hates sin, and you know you're a sinner, so that means God must hate me. That's not, that's not the gospel. The gospel is that God does hate sin. And when you were outside of the covenant of grace, you did stand in the wrath of God. But once you're saved, you now are a child. And that word is holy. It means that God has made you holy. So no longer are you a sinner. You have been turned into a saint. The God looks at you with the righteousness of Jesus put on you. One of the great things about your own identity is not just that God has, in His grace, saved you. He's made you holy. There's another word there in verse 12 that defines who we are that ought to include and make you want to worship. It's the, it's the word beloved. The English word beloved, it really is just the Greek word agape. He just loves you. One of the most securing things is to know that God in Christ loves you. The God who is holy and is going to punish sin, He looks at you and in Jesus, if you are in Jesus, he, he loves you. It's a wonderful thing to be loved by someone. It's a wonderful thing to know that someone actually loves you even in your unlovable moments. If you are married to someone that loves you, it is nice to know. It, it's just good. It feels good to be loved. Right? So you take what that feels like on human terms and, and multiply it by 12 billion and there you have the love of God who, who gives you great security. Let me just talk to all of you that are, are not married or maybe you've been through some terrible relationship it stripped you of your confidence. If you are a Christian, one of the most sanctifying and satisfying things is to know that God loves you. And if you ever get confident in the love of God, then you don't ever have to pursue love in some strange and sinful way. You don't need to be married to be complete. That if you are in Christ, you've been made complete in Jesus. So worship, worship reminds us who we are. We are chosen, holy, and loved. Let me show you something else about worship. Number two, worship reminds us how to live. Now, in verse 12, uh, you saw three means of identity, right? You saw chosen, holy, loved. But they're also, in verse 12, there are five virtues packed into verse 12, and they're all connected to one another. And this is how we actually live our lives, with these emotions, with these feelings, with these tendencies. They're all internal they're all connected together. Let me, there are five of them. Let me go through them. Uh, these internal things that, that, that affect our ability to love other people. Notice it with me in verse 12. So we've put on as God's chosen ones that are holy and beloved. Here's what we do. See the word put on? It's like, um, it's like what I did with this suit today. I put it on. And uh, found out that at the cleaners it had been shrunk. <laughs> or something. Packed into this vest like a summer sausage. <laughs> buttons about to fly off. But I put it on. I put one arm through and I put this thing on. I got it on. Better to look good than to feel good. You know what I'm saying? Put it on. And it is uncomfortable. That phrase, put on, it is, the, it is the exact phrase that would be used in, in regular Greek to put on clothing. And, and so Paul is saying, now that you are saved, you're, you're loved and holy and you're chosen by God, here's how we live. These are the things that we actually put on. There are five of them. Let me go through them very quickly. 
That first one is the word compassionate heart, to put on a compassionate heart. It's a Greek word, splognot has to do with, it really is just the word guts, that, that you feel things. As a Christian, you, you have empathy for people. One of the things that we are not allowed to be is cold-hearted when it comes to being a Christian. Think of the emotion you have if you're um, watching, let's say, a Hallmark movie. Not the emotion I have watching it, the emotion you have watching it. It, it hits at a visceral, right? It's a visceral level. Something strikes you, you don't mean for it to, it's just there. You, you feel it. That's the word. That as Christians, what do we put? We put on the ability to actually feel things with other people. It's the same thing Jesus did standing at the, at, at the tomb when Lazarus was laying dead in the tomb and his sisters were crying and all his friends were crying. Jesus knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead and it would be victorious. But with everybody upset, the Bible, go read the story, he felt it. And that's the word. Part of what we do and worship does is soften our hearts so that we feel it with one another. Because we live our lives with one another. Compassionate hearts. What else do you put on? These go together. Kindness and humility. Put those two together. Kindness and humility. Kindness is being able to, to see the needs of others and meet them. Kindness is wrapped up in patience, we'll deal with in just a little bit, is, is not feeling harshly against someone, even though they're different than you. These are traits that are necessary inside the church, right? And that word humility, John MacArthur, he says, um, I, I don't know if it's true, seems like everything he says is true, but John MacArthur says that the word humility didn't become a virtue until Christianity came on the scene. That prior to Christianity, the word humility really was an insult. But humility means that we put, we put others' needs ahead of ours. Humility means that we don't demand our own way. And so Paul, writing to a church, the church at Colossae, he says to them, there's some things you need to put on. Make sure you have a compassionate heart, that you're kind to each other, that you, you are putting other people's needs before yours. There are two others, two other words. That are worth looking at. It's the word meekness and patience. Let's put those two together. They come in couplets. Meekness and patience. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness it has to do with self-control and patience. That word patience especially. If you live by yourself and you watch church online, you don't have to be patient with other people. You come in this room and there are other opinions beside yours. There are, other, there are other political opinions beside yours. There are other theological, sometimes theological um, bents beside yours. And patience says you gather in a room to lift up the name of Jesus. We, we, we put up with one another and we do so joyfully. But it takes patience to do that. It means you don't get irritated at someone else because they are the way they are. When you want to ask them, hey, why are you like that? Patience means you understand yourself before God that the grace of God has changed you and you're willing to be in this room in the church with people that are different than you. See what worship does? Worship reminds us how to live. So verse 12, you have three things that give your identity. You are chosen, holy, and loved. And then you have five things that teach you how to live. So you put these garments on. Well, let's go a little further into the text. You'll find it in verse 13 and 14. Here's the third point. Number three, worship reminds us what to do. So, so there's some things we got to do when we worship. There are a couple of words here. I want to just spend some time talking about them. Let's see if we can go through. Start in verse 13 with me. <clears throat> Here's what we do. Bearing with one another. There are three of them. Bearing with one another, one another, forgiving one another, loving one another. Let's start with bearing. Bearing with one another. Or in, yours might say endure. To put up with. You know what this means? 
that you tolerate things. One of the greatest sanctifying things of, of marriage is that you learn to tolerate stuff. You learn today, you know, this is not just my world, this is somebody else's. Wait, now there's some kids coming in here. I tolerate all kind of stuff. <laughs> tolerate means, it doesn't mean you have to love it. You're not rejoicing in it. You are, you are making it so that that person can flourish in a way that's different from you, and you're not criticizing and going after it. You're tolerating that. One of the great virtues, that one of the great things we do in the church is stop from criticizing one another. We learn, even if we don't rejoice with, we at least can tolerate one another. We learn that we don't all have to be alike, but we all have to lift up the name of Jesus, and so we tolerate one another. Paul is writing to a church, not just to an individual, to a church saying this is one of the key factors of a church staying together and honoring God, tolerating one another. Bear with each other. But more than that, bearing with can, is, is, you can do that. There's another word that's harder. It's there in the text in verse 13. It's forgiving. Let me take you to forgiving. Bearing with one another, and notice all of the qualifiers of forgiving. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, spend some time in a church, you're going to have that. One has a complaint against another, what do we do with it? Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive one another. That word forgive uh, actually is the word grace. It's funny how Paul uses it. He takes grace and jams it in there. He even wrote it in a reflective manner, writing to the church. And here's how he writes it. We, you are to forgive yourselves. He's talking to the church and he says, look, forgive. Church, forgive the church. You forgive one another. To forgive somebody makes it so that you understand I'm a person of grace. I, I have received grace and I have an obligation to forgive. Now, just in case you forgot how to do it, Paul gives us two things right there in the text. He says that Jesus is our model. You see it? Our model and our motivation. Let me show the model first. Notice what he says. You are to forgive each other. How? As the Lord has forgiven you. So what's the model? The model is you as an individual, you have offended God in the highest degree and deserve to go to hell and deserve to die even right now. Yet God in his goodness has sent Jesus Christ who died on the cross for sinners, took the punishment, God raised him from the dead. You believed in that and God has forgiven you even though you offended him in the highest degree. So in the same way, this is what Paul says. Jesus is the model. Hanging on the cross, people that were killing him, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. As bad as someone has sinned against you, that person hasn't sinned as bad against you as you have against God. And God has forgiven you in Jesus. Jesus is the model. Therefore, as Christians, to make our worship mean something, we have to forgive each other. He's the model, but he's also the, the motivation. Here's what I mean. It's not just looking how he forgave. It's remembering how you were forgiven. It's remembering that you, you were lost. That, that you deserve to go to hell, and you didn't get hell, you have heaven. He's the model and the motivation for forgiveness. So two traits so far in verse 13, right? We tolerate, we bear with one another, we forgive each other. And there's a third one, drop down to verse 14, there's a third trait. This is another thing we do, verse 14. And above all of these, here comes the language again. Above all of these, that is to say, this one is going to bring them together, put on love. Notice what love does in verse 14. Put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Put them all. In fact, the way this is written, it's like the other garments come together and they, they stay together when you put your belt on. You think about why you put a belt on. I don't have a belt on today. I have braces on up under my vest. They're buttoned in. They're not, they're not suspenders. Suspenders clip on. That's what farmers and uh, carpenters and clowns wear. Clip on. <laughs> right? Clip on. I, that, is, that is not what I wear. They're buttoned in. And if you're wearing suspenders and a belt, then uh, you don't believe in something. You've got them both on. 
But the belt there is, is, it is serving a purpose, right? It is there to hold everything together so your pants don't fall down. So, so bring that to the text. And Paul says, above everything else, you make sure you run a belt through all the loops. It's going to hold everything together. And that belt is love. It's the, Greek, it's the Greek word agape. It's the one that Paul uses all the time. It means sacrificial love. It means you and I learn that above everything else, regardless what's holding us together, is that we love each other. Worship, worship reminds us what to do. We tolerate and forgive and, and love. Let me give you a fourth thing to consider. Number four. Worship reminds us Who's in charge? Who's in charge? Now, verse 15 and 16, they're very similar in the Senate structure. They're going to say different things, but they're very similar. Let's go to verse 15 and look at the who of verse 15. There's a command there. Let the peace of Christ, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. There's a lot going on there. Let's go through it and just sort of break it down. Let the peace of Christ, that word peace, it's not the word shalom, uh, word shalom it's the word arene. It has to do with um, the peace that Christ brings. So if Christ is in your life, he brings peace. Remember Paul says it's the peace that surpasses all understanding. So this is, the, this is peace that's come into your heart and life. It's going to affect the church. Verse 15, he's talking about the church. We're called together. We are in one body. And that peace, look at that word um, in verse 15, you see that word rule? That the peace of Christ rule? That word rule is not dominion like a king. That word rule really is more on the ground like an umpire. That, that, that's right in the midst of the game with you. And, and that's giving you direction and helping you make decisions. So the idea is that when you have the peace of God that comes through Jesus Christ, it's not so much the lordship that's over you. We certainly believe in that. It's right where you are so that when you're facing things, you're able to make decisions. Why? Because you have the peace of Christ that is ruling in your hearts. And the verse says that it holds us together and promotes this idea of thanksgiving. You know what worship does? Worship reminds us that God's in charge, guiding our decisions. And I'll tell you the truth, I've been in pastoral ministry for 25 years or more. And people that are at, people at most peace with God will bring the most peace to a congregation. And the flip side of that coin is true. People that are not at peace with God will bring the most trouble to a congregation. And what does worship do? We collectively brings us together, reminding us, who it is that's in charge. Let me give you a fifth thing to consider about worship. Number five, worship fills us up with the gospel. With the gospel. You'll see it right there in verse 16. See the structure, very similar to verse 15. Verse 16, notice what the text says. Here's the command. Let the word of Christ, that's the gospel. In fact, let me just sort of go through, define the terms, and we'll talk about it. Let the word of Christ, that's the gospel. That's Jesus' perfect life, his death on the cross, his resurrection, his ascension into heaven, and your belief in that. Okay, so let that, let it do what? Let the word of Christ dwell. That word dwell is um, to, to live, to take up residence, to find a home. So let the word of Christ dwell richly, that is to saturate. So how do we get the gospel to saturate every little part of who we are? How do we get uh, students to understand the gospel in such a way that it's going to change their lives? There are three primary ways right here. Right there in verse 16. Keep, keep looking at it. You see the ways? Three of them. Here's the first one. Teaching. The word teaching. You see it? Let the word of Christ richly dwell in your hearts. How? Teaching. What is teaching? It is opening the Bible, giving the information, pointing people to the truth of the scripture. It's why we do what we do on Sunday morning with the Bible. It's why we have Awana. It's why all of our ministries are centered around a book. We're people of the book. But teaching's not enough. You see that next word, verse 16? Teaching and then the word admonishing. Admonishing is different from teaching. Admonishing is not dispensing information. Admonishing is saying you need to do something with this information. 
Admonishing is, hey, you need to stop that behavior and start this behavior. Hey, this part of your life needs to change. And you'll notice that we admonish one another. That's accountability. Worship is us gathering together, singing with one another. And that's the third word. You see it? Singing. Notice what the text says. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Here they come. Singing. Three things. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Psalms is just what you think. It's in the Old Testament. Hymns is a more structured uh, song. And then spiritual songs is more emotive. All of them blend together. We are singing those things. Notice how you sing them. With thankfulness in your hearts to God. It's why, it's why singing, if teaching is for your mind and admonish, admonishing is for your heart, singing is for your soul. It's why it's important that we sing right things. Read the words sometimes of the songs we sing. They are theologically pointed to the goodness of God. And it's important that we sing with emotion. Why? Because it's not, just a, it's not enough to believe the right things. We've got to have the right heart. Do you see that from the very beginning we are a singing people? Do you know what ministry it is to my heart to sit right there on a Sunday morning and stand and see, see Gerald and those that are leading up here with enthusiasm, leading us singing right things and to have, I can hear you singing it washing over me. What encouragement that is to be with a group of people singing with thankfulness in our hearts. You know that music... It's a gift from God. God has given it to us, and it's the vehicle that carries the message. Music is not the message. It's the vehicle that carries the message. Music is useful because it helps us to learn things. Think about the ABCs. You learn the ABCs with a little song. Think about the, uh, the months, knowing how many days are in the month. It's a little song. Little songs help us to remember things. Songs help us to be encouraged. When I stand and sing to the glory of the Lord and I see you singing, it's encouraging to my heart. You've been through something terrible and you're fighting depression. One of the greatest things is to be in the church with the congregation singing. You go to a funeral sometime and what, what kind of songs do they choose but those that bring comfort? Singing. Singing is not just the words that inspire me. It is actually singing collectively with the congregation, thankfulness in our hearts, singing to the Lord. You see, worship, it, it fills us up. This is why we do the things we do at Hickory Grove. It fills us up with the gospel. And then there's one last verse down in verse 17. What does worship do? Here's a sixth point. Six points. I had done this in a while. Six points. You know what worship does? Worship actually becomes a lifestyle. Worship becomes a lifestyle. The key to worship, look, the key to worship is, is to not focus on worship. We focus on God. Worship is there to focus us on God. And you get to verse 17, and honestly, I'm, I'm going to close with this verse because here is the most basic rule of thumb for Christian living is verse 17. You should circle that, write it down somewhere, put it on your refrigerator, on your mirror. You can see it when you're shaving in the morning. Notice what the text says. Here's what worship is. Whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. You know what that means? That means that worship is actually a life that is overshadowed by the cross of Jesus. Let me ask you this as I close. Does your life flourish in the cross of Jesus? Are you prompted to live your life in word and deed to the glory of Jesus? Do you enjoy coming and lifting up your voice to sing to the Lord do, do you receive the food of God's word as it's taught and as we admonish one another? This place and this people and this church is designed to worship. And our worship points us to Jesus. You join me as we pray together? With your heads bowed this morning as we go to the Lord. Time of commitment and prayer.
God has spoken to your heart, one of the things we do as a part of our worship is to provide an invitation. And what I mean by that is just inviting you to respond to what you've heard. Maybe you'd like for a pastor to pray with you. Maybe you'd like to talk about membership. Maybe you're uncertain about what it means to become a Christian and you want further conversation. We do that as we sing. You'll see pastors standing here and I'll invite you to come forward. Father, thank you for your word that is good and for your spirit that moves. Thank you for the joy of worshiping our risen Savior. And I pray you build this church as a church, a group of people that loves to worship Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Would you stand please as we sing together?